All right. Thanks, everyone. I think this is the third episode now. This is going to be on advanced concepts for concussions. Marie and Katie Cole can have a better uh, title than that. But Marie is going to be starting us off. Uh, Marie's from Stanford. She's the PT for Stanford Athletics. And then Katie is the current resident at MGH slash Northeastern, just finishing up her residency at this point. Um, so from then on, I'll let you guys take it away. And Marie, Marie I'm going to make and you should be good. You can share your screen now. All righty. Thank you, Vian. Let's see here. Where'd that go? Not sure why I can't share this. Are you the host yet? I am, yeah. It says I am. Sorry, guys. You were for like a second and then it stopped. I'm not sure why. Yeah. Do you still have the green button? Yeah. Uh, I Was it sharing the uh, PowerPoint? Mm, there's a quick glimpse. It just see. came up and said like here and screen, but we couldn't see anything. Let's try this again. Oh, there you go. There we go. Hey, Rob, you mind if you turn your mic off, please, by any chance? Some sweet airplane noises, though. <laughs> Thank you. All righty. So thanks, guys, for tuning in. Thanks, Vian, for having us. Uh, we're going to be talking about some of the advanced cervical considerations after sport-related concussion. Um, so I'm going to start off here. Um, as Vian said, my name is Marie Bu. I'm one of the physical therapists at Stanford University. I did a sports residency at Texas Health Sports Medicine, uh, what was formerly Ben Hogan. Um, so we worked at conjunction with TCU um, and then part-time in a clinic at Texas Health Resources. So uh, worked there uh, for a little bit while, maybe a year or so after um, my residency, and then uh, came to Stanford. I've been here now for four and a half years or so, so it's, uh, it's been a good time. Um, so today, getting more into the uh, cervical considerations, we see a lot of concussions. Uh, we have a pretty, I would call, robust program here with our concussions, which is nice. Um, and I think the cervical side of things is something that's becoming uh, a lot more prominent and was, I think, kind of neglected for a little while. Um, so I wanna really go through some of the things and tease out uh, some of the important differences between uh, vestibular and ocular as well as concussion, or uh, sorry, as well as cervical. So we're gonna go over some of the signs and symptoms, neuropathoanatomy. We'll go through uh, the evaluation Katie's gonna take over the treatment and prehab, and then I'm gonna go through a case study at the end. So with, uh, if so an athlete walks in, uh, they have these symptoms, as you can see here. Um, if anyone wants to unmute or not, that's fine. But what would be your diagnosis? If somebody had irritability, dizziness, neck pain, altered sleep, I think the first thing a lot of us think about is concussion. Actually, there's 70% uh, of people with uh, cervical issues uh, after whiplash, and then 50% have uh, visual and balance disturbances just after a whiplash. So we always think about dizziness being a telltale sign of vestibular involvement, but it can also be a telltale sign of cervical involvement something that you definitely don't want to miss um, in your examination and treatment with these athletes. So this is, we're going to talk about the cervical spine, uh, but there's a lot of different aspects with sport related concussions and they don't occur in isolation. So this is uh, a diagram that overviews some of the complexities and extensiveness um, that all of them are related. Um, it's important to know that the cervical spine is related to the vestibular system, the visual system, um, motor, uh, motor patterns, as well as postural stability for the whole body. So it's uh, responsible 
So if you have the cyclical involvement, it can be responsible for some of the other symptoms um, and integrated uh, very closely with all the other symptoms that you can see. This was a nice article from JOSPT recently that helps to with differential diagnosis uh, between cervical, vestibular, uh, and psychological aspects of uh, head and neck injuries. Now, if we look primarily at the cervical spine here, uh, which we'll go over in a second, but overview is you'll have musculoskeletal impairments, joint position error, uh, increased sway, uh, you'll have a positive smooth pursuit neck torsion test. All of these findings, you don't have to have all of them, but they should definitely indicate that you need to examine, examine the cervical spine more. So we'll get into some of that now. Starting with, we'll go over red flags. You absolutely need to rule out um, red flags if you're thinking about uh, cervical involvement after concussion. And then if you do think it's evolved, then we'll go through all of the other examinations um, to help figure out what's the etiology and help then go through your treatment. So first, cervical spine, uh, the Canadian C-spine rules are of utmost importance. Um, I think we all know them, but it's to rule in or rule out whether you need radiographs. So basics, um, over the age of 65, a dangerous mechanism of injury that you can see on the side there, paresthesias in uh, more than one extremity, and then if they can't rotate their head 45 degrees uh, either direction, would all be indicative of a radiograph. Um, this is a very high sensitivity and a negative likelihood ratio of less than 5% which basically means uh, if it is negative with that, there's a less than 5% chance that it's a false negative that they actually have uh, the condition. Next, we'll get to our safety tests here. Um, this is gonna look at upper cervical stability. So at C1, C2, um, there's a lot of mobility and not a lot of bony stability. So this is definitely something that you need to know very clearly um, and be able to test correctly. So first one is just straight Petman's distraction. That's gonna be testing your ligamentum nuque and your tectoral membrane. Uh, then you have the alar ligament test. Um, basically you're holding, uh, this is the C, the top picture there. You're gonna be palpating uh, C2 spinous process and lamina, and you can either passively side bend or rotate them. And you should feel about 20 to 30 degrees of movement um, at that C2 that you're palpating. Abnormal sign would be you don't feel any movement there. Uh, next, you have the transverse ligament test. Um, basically, you have your hands right between um, the occiput and C2, and you lift their heads straight up, hold for 10 seconds. Uh, what you're looking for is nystagmus, any symptoms like they have a lump in their throat, uh, facial numbness, anything like that would be a positive sign. Then you have your lateral shear test. That's gonna be uh, evaluating for a dens fracture. And basically you're just moving C1 on C2 and trying to shear that, uh, those two bones together. Uh, if you're looking for any laxity or a, uh, you should have a pretty firm end feel. If you don't have that, um, that would be a positive test as well as any other of the symptoms. And then finally, sharp purser. This is gonna look at the transverse ligament instability. So basically, if this is positive, the dens is slipping into the spinal cord, which obviously we need to then immediately refer. So what you do for this, have them look down. Uh, if they start to feel any numbness um, or tingling down their back, that would be a positive test. If they don't necessarily feel that, you can block C2 and then push the cranium posteriorly. Um, if you're doing that and you feel a clunk, um, you feel that um, they have symptoms, and then you feel movement with that, that would all be a positive test. Uh, if they don't have any of those, uh, you're probably safe to continue on. But if they do have any of these, you absolutely need to refer. Uh, next, cervical myelopathy. Um, I have never seen this in clinic. Uh, if you work in an outpatient setting, you may happen to see this more often, but important to know still. Um, so this is testing for any spinal cord compression. So if they're over the age of 45, uh, they have a positive Hoffman sign. She gets that top one. Basically you put their finger in that swan neck uh, position and flick their uh, nail. A positive sign is both their thumb and their fingers flex. 
uh, inverted supinator sign, which is uh, you do a brachioradialis um, reflex test. A normal should be a C6 uh, pattern. So they should have elbow flexion and wrist pronation. If it's abnormal, they'll have a C7 uh, test. So they'll have elbow extension and finger flexion. So if they have that, that would be a positive test. Then you have Babinski's, which I'm sure we're all familiar with um, on the bottom of the foot and they'll splay or extend their toes. And then lastly, um, having gait abnormalities are almost like a sticky gait. If they have three or more of these, it's a 31 times that they're more likely to have a cervical myelopathy, uh, which again would uh, warrant a referral. If they don't have these, you're, oh, we have one more, sorry. Last one is the um, vertebral basilar insufficiency tests. Uh, you definitely wanna do this before you do any type of manipulation of the cervical spine. So you uh, do ipsilateral rotation, side bending and extension and hold that uh, for 30 seconds. You're looking for diplopia, dizziness, dysphagia, dysarthria, decreased hearing, facial numbness or syncope, which would all be a positive test. Uh, you also need to make sure that they don't have any baseline nystagmus before you do this, um, as that could kind of concomitate the test results. Um, also, if you suspect that they have BPPV, you don't want to put them in this position because it will make them dizzy, have nystagmus, all of those things. So you'd want to test them in the modified test position, which you see on that bottom picture. Basically, have them just lean forward to get that extension, rotation, and side bend. Uh, and then that won't elicit any of the uh, canals in their ear. So once you're through that, then you have your safety test. You know that you are good to go through the rest of your exam, which then starts with uh, your regular active range of motion. Make sure you're looking at both the upper and the lower cervical spine with this uh, and not just saying grossly the spine in general. Um, also make sure you're doing your overpressures to clear it and looking for any symptoms with this or any aberrant motions with this. Um, I definitely have seen athletes who they're just rotating nice and easy uh, and they start to feel dizziness with that, which obviously would uh, need to look at further, but that would definitely indicate that you need to look at cervical spine uh, a lot more closely to see if that's involved. Then you look at your passive range of motion uh, and then your joint play. So especially joint play with the upper cervical spine. If uh, um, people with cervicogenic headaches, they only have about 25 to 28 degrees of Atlantia, uh, AA rotation um, versus 45 degrees in asymptomatic individuals. So it's definitely something that you need to pay attention to um, is that upper cervical spine rotation. And then just go through the rest of the cervical spine, uh, CT junction, your upper thoracic spine, first and second ribs, as well as TMJ, which can all contribute um, to some of the symptoms they might be feeling. Then we'll start to look at the soft tissue. With cervicogenic headaches in particular, um, people will, rep will report feeling um, kind of a headache or pressure in an anterior posterior, what we call an, a ram's horn um, pattern. It'll often be unilateral, can be bilateral. Um, and then you can uh, change the symptoms either for better or for worse with palpating these specific muscles, uh, especially scalenes, upper trap, temporalis, um, SCM also, and then also get a lot with levator and suboccipitals. So do your thorough palpation uh, on both sides to really see if any soft tissue is involved and causing any of these headaches uh, if they're feeling headache. Then you have your deep cervical uh, neck flexor assessment. Yonda um, proposed the, where you lift up, look, said to basically look at your toes. What you're looking for is a smooth reverse of the lordosis of the cervical spine, as well as the fact that they can keep their chin tucked the whole time. Um, with this is dysfunctional, they'll usually lead with their chin and kind of protract their um, chin, as the, especially at the start of the movement. So be careful to watch of how they're doing these motions. Um, there's also the cranial cervical flexor test. Sorry, going back to the Yanda's, average for that should be around 45 seconds. Uh, they should be able to maintain that. 
that is a really long time. Um, and I'd say a lot of people have a hard time doing that, but that is what would be considered normal is 45 seconds. Then the bottom picture is the craniocervical flexor test. So that's where you inflate uh, blood pressure cuff or any other um, inflatable cuff underneath their neck, inflate it to 20 millimeters of mercury and have them uh, tuck their chin and maintain that and hold it. If they're able to do that successfully, then you increase it by two millimeters of mercury uh, with the goal of getting up to 30. Uh, those patients that have uh, any type of cervical involvement, uh, especially cervicogenic headaches, uh, usually have decreased strength and or endurance with these tests. So it's definitely important to look at, um, again, so you can help guide your treatment. Now we're gonna get into the special tests that really help to differentiate your um, cervical involvement compared to any other vestibular or ocular involvement that the athlete might have. So for cervicogenic dizziness, if they have dizziness with this test, which I'll show you a video in a second, um, it'll be because they have abnormal um, activity of their cervical musculature. And um, they're getting kind of a mismatch between uh, what their neck proprioceptors are feeling. So what you have them do is you sit in a test. I usually sit in front of them and have them keep their eyes open so I can watch um, their eye movements. Where'd that go? Here we go. You have them rotate back and forth. And this completely takes the head out of it. So if you've done your VOR test and they have a positive test, that could be more indicative of a vestibular issue, although you can't necessarily tease that out right then. And then you can do this test. Their head is stationary and their body is moving and that can help you differentiate that it's cervical and not vestibular. Next, you have your joint position sense. So your joint position um, is your ability to relocate your head either to neutral or to a set position in space. Uh, and this is the function of the muscle spindles. So you have your athlete sit three feet away from the target with a laser pointer on their head, uh, eyes closed, and they go through active range of motion and then back to either the center or whatever position that you predetermined. Uh, and you're looking for that error and the error will be from the zero point. So if it's neutral, bring their head back and you look where that laser pointer is. Uh, normal is less than 4.5 degrees. So if they're within the yellow or closer, that would be considered normal. Abnormal is anything greater than 4.5 degrees. So the red um, or oftentimes athletes won't even be on the paper. Um, that's uh, a positive test. A uh, couple things to note with this, you should have the athlete turn pretty slowly. You want it to be less than two degrees per second. Um, and the reason for that is if you're going faster, it can actually elicit the vestibular system, which you don't want to elicit in this test. Um, people with neck pain, whether it's traumatic or atraumatic, will have increased joint position error, but those with just vestibular loss do not. They'll be able to relocate that within the normal limits. And then lastly is the smooth pursuit neck torsion test. And we're gonna get into this a little bit more in the case study. Um, but basically you have them do regular smooth pursuit in some capacity and then rotate their head and repeat the same thing. Uh, they might have uh, altered gaze pattern. You might be able to see it uh, actually, the, any type of saccades or um, they also might have any symptoms with it, dizziness, blurry vision, all of those would be a positive test. Um, you should have no change if they have any type of vestibular dysfunction. Um, and this is a very sensitive test for um, cervicogenic dizziness, as you can see with the sensitivity and specificity being uh, right at 90 and 91%. So it's really important to go through a thorough assessment and really tease out which buckets they fall into if they have a concussion, whether it's just cervical, cervical and vestibular, um, ocular, whatever that may be to help guide your treatment, um, which is what Katie's gonna go through next. So let me make Katie a host here. All right. All right.
Can you guys see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. See the presenter. So hi everyone. My name is Katie. We see the presenter view right now. Okay. Um, let's see. Good. You're, yeah, you're good now. Okay. Cool. So hi everyone. My name is Katie Colgan. I'm currently the sports PT resident at Mass General and Northeastern University, and I went to PT school at the University of Pittsburgh. So really excited to be talking to you all on St. Patrick's Day. Um, so I'm just gonna be going into the treatment of the cervical spine patient uh, with concussion. So your goals of treatment are gonna be to decrease your, oops, sorry, um, decrease your symptoms, increase mobility, uh, optimize strength, enhance your proprioception and improve your function. Um, so patient education is usually the first course of action that I take with any concussion patient. A lot of people, either whether they're athletes or just regular patients, they often don't have too much information and they think that they're just supposed to sit in a dark room until they feel better. So educating them that relative rest for the first one or two days is okay. And then you really wanna get back into your resumption of your normal routine. And uh, teaching them that symptoms are okay um, it doesn't necessarily have to be totally sub symptomatic, but you want to generally avoid increasing symptoms to a provocative level. So um, this is out of the consensus statement out of Berlin from 2016, which is a really good resource. If you guys are interested in concussion patients, I'd highly recommend taking a look at it. Um, but basically, it just walks you through the stages of return to sport. So each stage should take about a day and you're gonna be returning to your previous stage if they have symptoms at that stage. So teaching your athlete that it's gonna take at least a week for them to get back into full play um, is important. So this is just um, some data from some recent research that has come out that indicates that the amount of time that you take from the initial injury to your return to play can affect how quickly you can get back into sport. So looking at the chart on the left, the dotted line there is an immediate removal from activity. And then the dash line is the delayed removal from activity. So you can see obviously that they have an increased number of days missed than those athletes who are immediately re uh, removed from play. So for me, it's important to just educate your athletes that you really wanna have them report their symptoms immediately if they get hit or if they you know, are feeling dizzy or fall down or something like that. Um, and then on the right here, you can see, this is a recent article that came out by Charik in 2020. And it's kind of just indicating that there might potentially be a dose response relationship between how quickly the athlete is removed from play and their um, return, from act return to full activity. So you can see on the left-hand column there that the athletes that were removed immediately had about uh, like a 19 day from injury to full clearance and 27% of those athletes had protracted recovery. And then if they played for less than 15 minutes after they were injured, 67% of those athletes had a protracted recovery. And if they played longer than 15 minutes, 81% of those athletes had a protracted recovery. So you really wanna make sure that you're educating your athlete that the quicker that you remove them from play, the quicker that they'll be able to get back to playing at a high level. Um, and then also touching on second impact syndrome, saying that this is really rare, but it could potentially be a serious thing that you're dealing with. So if you're having any symptoms, you really want to make us aware of it right away. Um, in terms of postural considerations, this is something that I say with all of my cervical patients, not just concussion patients, but telling them that your posture isn't necessarily bad. Uh, when I was making these slides, I definitely look like the guy on the left. So, you know, it's more important about st not staying in one posture throughout the day, but consistently changing your posture. So often I'll educate people to just like put an alarm on your phone um, so that, that you're not just sitting down for eight hours straight. It's especially tough right now in COVID when everybody's working from home. A lot of students are like taking their classes on Zoom from their bed. So having them say, you know, make sure that you're sitting at your desk, sit at your kitchen table or something. Um, I'll tell them to like use a towel roll as a cue behind them so that they're sitting upright, but just trying to give them some indications on things that can be helpful in terms of posture. Um, and then getting into some of your manual therapy techniques. 
Um, so initially you always wanna focus on the symptom modulation piece when your athlete is acute. So like Marie was talking about, a lot of these patients will have um, suboccipital pain or like myofascial pain in general. So considering your suboccipital release is really important um, just in supine doing trigger point releases or soft tissue massage, things like that can be really useful in terms of modulating symptoms in the cervicogenic patient. And then after that, um, often I'll do these things concurrently, but working on mobility optimization as well. So joint mobs for sure, assessing which segments are restricted. And like Marie was saying, you really wanna address the upper cervical spine because often this is where the limitations lie. And then also considering a grade five mobilization. Um, these are often, you wanna consider your risk first reward with these patients. So it's pretty low risk for a patient with a concussion to have um, any problems with doing a grade five, but like Marie was saying, rule out all of your red flags before you're considering this. And often I'll like to start at the T-spine or the CTJ and then work my way up because there's a lot of research out like this article by Gonzalez and Glacius that says that if you're mobilizing the T-spine, you can have effects at the cervical spine and affecting headaches for up to a month after you perform the mobilization. Um, and then you always just want to follow that up with the home exercise plan. So having them work into their active range of motion, increasing their mobility. And then I like doing this one as well, too, if they have a positive response to doing the joint mobs. So it's just working on increasing them. This picture is showing rotation. So you have them rotate into the restrictive range of motion. Um, and I usually just tell them to like get a towel and lay it across your cheek. So you're going along the range of motion and the towels lined up with the segment that's restricted. In terms of strengthening, um, these are the muscle groups that you want to strengthen here. Deep cervical flexors and extensors. Um, you want to make sure that you have a good ratio of strength between flexors and extensors. So you're avoiding that like bobblehead phenomenon. So strengthening both of those. And like Marie was talking about, often the deficit won't be in the brute strength, but in the endurance. So as the patient gets less symptomatic and as they get better at activating this musculature, you wanna work on sustained holds and stuff like that. Um, and then your periscapular musculature, like we talked about, this is similar with an orthopedic neck patient that you would see in a clinic as well. So working on um, lower traps, middle traps, rhomboids, serratus, levator scap, and then just thinking about your progressions as well. Um, so like I talked about, thinking about the endurance piece or progressing your patient from performing an exercise in prone to in quadruped. Um, and like I said, just consider your dosing. These are small muscles and they're not going to be lifting a ton of weight. So often I'll be trying to do a lot of reps or you know a sustained hold as opposed to having them like lift a ton of weight when I'm doing like lower traps or middle trap exercises. Um, and then getting into the proprioception piece, this is really big and where I think the concussion aspect kind of plays in. So often I'll do like a lag test with someone. So you have them hold their head steady and you will like kind of push their head around a little bit um, and see if they're able to sustain it or if like when you press on it, they're not able to keep it in one spot. And that would just indicate impaired proprioception. So then um, if I'm seeing that, training them on that by using like Marie was saying the head laser, you can have them look back and forth between two targets. Um, and usually I'll just start with their eyes open where they'll move their eyes to the one target and then move their head and then look back and forth and do that. Um, you can progress it by having them start looking at the one target and then they close their eyes and look to where they think the next target will be and open. And it will just give them a little bit of feedback on seeing where their impairments are, if they're able to kind of maintain that or not. And then this picture on the right is showing a maze as well. So having them, you know, it's just like a little bit more interesting. They can work through the maze and um, it's good. They're using a head laser with this as well. Um, and then some more things like I talked about with the lag test, you can do the same thing essentially with some alternating isometrics at the cervical spine. So obviously you're not applying too much pressure but just telling the patient to meet your resistance um, and initially you can start with their eyes open and then progress to doing it with their eyes closed. So you can continue to work on that. And it's the same thing in the upper extremity as well. Um, and then Marie was talking about using a, a PBU as well for testing. Um, 
which I'll do. And I also like to use it for patients when I'm doing treatment stuff. So it's sometimes really helpful. This picture isn't really great, but you can see there's like colors down on the left-hand side of the dial. So if they're starting at 20 millimeters of mercury, they can kind of work their way up between the colors up to 30 degrees of, uh, or 30 millimeters of mercury. And then if you wanna make it you know, more exciting for them, you can tell them different colors and they have to move back and forth between them. So you're working on them responding to your uh, cues. Um, and then in terms of sports specific treatment, this is where you can really get uh, creative. You wanna work with your athlete and see if you don't know that much about their sport, what they need to be doing and what they feel like they're impaired with. Um, so a lot of the time I'll just talk to my patient and you wanna make it position specific as well, making sure that they're able to do everything that's required of them. Um, so in terms of exertion, you wanna make sure that you're upping their cardiovascular capacity as well. So I'll usually start them on a bike so that they're not getting a ton of visual and vestibular input. And then you can progress to their mode of activity. So if they're a runner or if they play soccer or something, having them running on a treadmill. And then if they're a hockey player, usually I'll have them be skating. Um, so like I said, you wanna modify as needed, do what you need to do, but you can really be creative with these patients, which makes it fun to work with them. Um, and also just keeping in mind that concussion is multimodal. Often these patients aren't gonna fit just into one bucket. So you wanna make sure that you're addressing those impairments that they have outside of the cervical spine as well. Um, a big thing for me that I've really enjoyed with working with the concussion patients is working on a part of a multidisciplinary care team. So considering reject, um, I'm sorry, considering referrals for injections has been really helpful. Um, and usually I've worked with PMNR for this, but there are also headache specialists, which can come from a variety of different specialties. Um, trigger points of if you have a patient who responds like fairly well to STM, but they're not getting enough relief from it, sometimes the trigger point injections can be really helpful with this. And PMNR has usually been the one, my go-tos for that. Um, and then if they're getting those um, suboccipital headaches and the ram's horn pattern, sometimes a C2 nerve root injection might be helpful as well. And recently at Northeastern, um, I saw a patient who got a Botox injection she was more of a chronic pain patient. So that's kind of where they were coming from in that respect. But there were some smaller studies that were indicating that this can be helpful for patients with concussions as well. And then thinking about, and this isn't just for your cervical spine patient, but all your concussion patients, but referrals to the neuropsych, neurooptometry, or your psychologist and psychiatrist, that can all be really helpful. Um, and then always keeping open communication with your referring physician, your athletic trainer, and your patient too. So this starts on day one and goes throughout your entire plan of care. And then getting into some prehab stuff, um, really you wanna start treating your concussions before they actually happen. So looking at your helmet assessments, obviously it, I think we all know it hasn't been conclusively proven that helmets can prevent concussion. They're gonna pre prevent those, you know, more traumatic injuries um, like hematomas and stuff like that, but working on um, making sure that your patients are being fitted properly for their concussions is really important. And there was an article that came out in Sports Health last year, I think, that said that poor helmet fit can increase the severity of the concussion. Um, looking at like a bunch of athletic trainers, they were assessing if the fit of the helmet was correct and the ones that were incorrect had more, were more likely to get severe concussions. Um, and then you also want to just consider what type of helmet you're using. So for someone like a football player, their helmet is made to sustain a lot of hits over a, a season. But for somebody who does motocross or skis, their helmet is made to sustain only one like heavy impact that might be traumatic. So if they have a big fall or something, you're going to want to get a helmet right after that, a new one, because it's probably not as effective as you would want it to be. And then also with your athletes, just, you know, doing baseline testing prior to the onset of the season so that you have something to compare to if they do get a concussion. And what I've seen here in Boston is that often we'll do this baseline concussion. And then if people are falling below the norm, then we'll try and train them on those things that they're doing. So SCAT 5 and the impact are really popular ones. And we'll also do some visual vestibular testing and working on 
strength or cervical um, range of motion and stuff like that as well. And then looking here, this is a DynaVision. Um, not everybody has access to these, but they're really fun to play with. Um, so you can do some visual vestibular training and um, there's some really interesting studies um, on the group out of University of Cincinnati with Joe Clark. He basically compared um, the seasons where they didn't do visual vestibular training to the seasons where they did. And the rate of concussions dropped from 9.1 to 1.4. So it was a pretty significant change in terms of number of training. And basically what they did was they used a DynaVision. They did a lot of like eye tracking things. Um, his article is really interesting. So I'd recommend checking that out if you can. But if you see your athletes that you've done this testing on are impaired using a DynaVision to have them work on light tracking and Basically, it's just like it, the board lights up and you can like hit the button and then another one will light up. You can hit the button um, and you can make this sport in position specific. So for a wide receiver, you can make most of the targets overhead. And for someone who's a lineman, you can just have it kind of in front of you, um, which can be helpful as well. And then, like I talked about, just giving them some general information on postural retraining, um, you know, telling them, you know, it's normal to have be sitting forward in your seat and stuff like that, especially now with COVID, but you just wanna be aware of giving yourself an ergonomic setup and um, making sure that you're being aware of these things throughout the day. And working on periscapular and deep neck flexor strengthening in general, just with all of your patients as you've screened them, seeing what impairments they have and then you know, addressing as necessary. So I think we're gonna go into the case study now. I'll make Marie the host again. All right. All right. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. So just briefly go over a case study um, of an athlete that I had a couple years ago. I um, actually just published this case study earlier this year in August or so. Um, so if you wanna look at it, feel free, but we'll go over the majority of it. Um, so it was a 22 year old division one female soccer player that I had. She was coming back um, from somewhere back home, I think, um, and got into a car accident going 75 miles an hour. Um, she was transported to the ED, Glasgow coma scale was normal, no loss of consciousness, uh, nausea, amnesia, anything like that no neuro deficits. Um, they did take uh, plain films uh, because of the dangerous mechanism, which were negative, and she was discharged from the ED uh, that same day. She saw our physician uh, the next day, who diagnosed her with a concussion and cervical strain, referred her, um, and then she actually started her stationary bike uh, cardio, that's uh, day one afterwards. Uh, I saw her day two after the car accident. Um, you can see her symptoms were pretty moderate. Um, she was had a lot of uh, fatigue, neck pain. She also had difficulty with reading and concentration. Um, history of one prior concussion two years previously, um, and it resolved quickly within a week. So that was voted well, hopefully, we'll see. Um, objectively, I still checked all of her um, upper C-spine instability tests, which were negative. Um, she had negative arterial tests as well. Uh, active range of motion was limited, but she did have that full or greater than 45 degrees of rotation. Um, again, to note in that uh, Canadian C-spine rule. She had a lot of tenderness and trigger points throughout cervical spine and suboccipitals, as you can see. Uh, she did have a positive um, dynamic VOR, so walking VOR. Um, horizontally, she couldn't get to 180 degrees uh, per minute, or sorry, 180 beats per minute. Um, she would have a retinal slip, so the letters she couldn't keep in focus. Um, and then vertical, she was able to do it, but she had symptoms with it. Uh, visual motion sensitivity was positive horizontally. D uh, dynamic visual acuity was also positive horizontal. Uh, and then she did have a positive um, cervicogenic dizziness tests where she was moving the, her body underneath her head. 
and then uh, best was abnormal as well. Uh, we also did, um, so disclosure, I'm a um, advisor for this company called iSync or SyncThink. Uh, we do eye tracking. So not trying to do anything with that, but I just get to use the equipment and play around with it. So that's why we did this test. Um, so I wanted to quantify her smooth pursuit neck torsion test just to see if it would change anything. Um, so an overall kind of recap on eye tracking, it's basically a objective way to quantify eye movements. Well, I'll show you uh, what it looks like in a second, um, but it's an assessment of visual performance of smooth pursuit. And you're looking for any variability um, of their eye position to the target position as it moves around. So it's based in neuroscience. Um, and we think that potentially with a concussion, you can have some shearing of um, different pathways throughout the brain, um, primarily that affect the cerebellum, which is responsible for timing. Um, in a predictive setting, uh, your brain is actually predicting everything. So it's two and a half seconds or so in the future. And your cerebellum is responsible for delaying the timing of everything. So if you think about it, if you're uh, playing tennis and you're easily just kind of lobbing the ball back and forth to each other. It's very predictable of where it's gonna go. Your brain actually can figure out where it's gonna go quite soon. And so it's already anticipating where it's gonna be. And your brain is responsible for delaying your swing until the timing is appropriate. Uh, with concussions, if you have that shearing force that's disrupting that, sometimes that can cause a disinhibition of the concussion or of the uh, cerebellum. So it's not being inhibited properly. So first, what the test is, is you just basically follow this dot in a circle. Very predictable, very easy. This is what the outcome looks like. So this is totally normal. Um, the lines are actually pictures of where the eye is in place. So on the left-hand side, you can see it's a very smooth circular pattern. On the right-hand side, it's uh, very much in a small ball formation. So that means there's not a lot of variability from where the eye tra or where the dot is compared to where their eye is. So it's right tracking at the appropriate time. With a concussion, we've actually found that you can have what we call these forward saccades. It's like we talked about the cerebellum is not being inhibited uh, correctly. So the eyes are jumping forward before they should. They're already guessing where it's gonna be without being able to actually be on the target when it's supposed to. So I say all of this, we did the uh, smooth pursuit neck torsion test. So the top one um, of our athlete, that was her straightforward, looked fantastic. Um, one, of, one of the best eye trackings that we've had. Uh, the middle one is her to right rotation. Uh, and then the bottom one is left rotation. And while it's not that bad, it's definitely worse than her baseline. So she has some forward saccades. She also complained of blurry vision while she was doing this. Um, so again, this was just something I wanted to try to see if we could objectively track now that I, now that I knew that cervical was a big component for her, if we could objectively track the progress um, as she was going through with our rehab. So when I saw her, um, going back to our case study here, we did a lot of soft tissue, um, some traction, which helped decrease some of the pressure and headache that she was having and some joint mobilizations. Uh, did some deep cervical uh, activation and strengthening, focusing on the endurance. And then we also did different um, stabilization exercises in sitting to increase the postural demand. I sent her home with exercises primarily for her vestibular issues and her concussion for visual motion sensitivity, VOR and balance. Um, and then she continued uh, stationary biking each day. Are the next day, her symptoms had gone down quite a bit, actually. She was able to do a horizontal VOR uh, at the appropriate speed, but had symptoms. She, her visual motion sensitivity was fine at this point. Um, so we again worked a lot on the um, soft tissue component um, and decreasing pain. Updated her home program uh, and she continued biking each day with her athletic trainer. Days four to six, again, we just kind of progressed, um, I think she was on her own at this time, progressed her um, exercises for her concussion and vestibular symptoms and then stationary bike. 
Day seven, she had no baseline symptoms. Um, she was cleared from all vestibular issues and was actually cleared from her concussion uh, by me with her vestibular symptoms and by our team physician uh, to return, to start getting into the return to play progression. Uh, we repeated her smooth pursuit neck torsion. I should have included that. Um, it was better, but still not great uh, to where it should be. So while she was already back into play, we continued doing uh, manual therapy with her, um, getting some cervical spine stabilization or muscular re-education. And then she was actually uh, discharged by me on day 15. This is what her eye tracking looked like at the end here. Um, and she had, if you again, um, looking normal, just central, uh, B was looking to right rotation and C was to left rotation. And everything now is completely normal and the same. Um, so it was interesting to see that you could objectively track some of her neck pain and the improvements in that, as well as the improvements in her eye tracking with cervical rotation. So um, again, you guys don't have to have a um, eye tracking device to do this, but something that you can periodically test and see if it's getting any better. Um, you can look at it subjectively and see if their eyes um, are able to track better as well. So overall, um, basically you cannot miss cervical spine uh, with athletes with concussion. Like I said before, I think it was something that was missed a lot before and we just chucked everything up to concussion. Uh, it's important to be able to tease it out so you can have uh, an appropriate treatment uh, paradigm and get them back as quickly and safely as possible. These are Katie Mai's references. We'll open it up to questions. Hey Katie, hey Marie, thanks for uh, presenting. That was really good stuff. Uh, I, I thought the first minute was there. I already learned a pearl from you about, you know, how 70% of people don't have dizziness. And that's like the first thing or sometimes the only things a lot of people ask about. So that's cool. Um, my first question is, so usually we're able to work on this a lot with patients with chronic concussions. How often do you clear someone because they can tolerate activity in their sport again, but you still keep them in for the cervical component? Sorry, ask that once more, one more time again. Um, so yeah, sorry, that's a confusing question. So let's say they had a concussion, acute concussion. Um, they can tolerate like symptoms wise playing sports again, but they still have these cervical deficits. Um, how often do you keep them in rehab after they've returned to the field to work on these cervical deficits? Mm. Um, I will keep them, I mean, basically as long as it's needed, hope it doesn't take too much longer. Um, that my, my soccer athlete only took about an extra week. Um, but at that point, it kind of depends on if they're in season, on the road, if they're here um, and we'll, we're, I'll work with the athletic trainer and I'll do maybe a day with me and a day with the athletic trainer um, or two days into whatever um, it may be. I also think it is determined by how uh, impaired they are, how tight their neck is um, and what exactly is going on. If it's some simple, um, joint mobilizations like Katie was talking about, we can get them to do stuff on their own. That's a lot easier and saves everybody some time. Um, but I will absolutely continue to see them uh, until they get that back. Um, and I have the luxury of doing that. I know not everybody does if you're dealing with insurance, but uh, if you don't address the cervical spine, I also think it can lead to kind of the sequela of um, long-term chronic neck pain and lack of movement, things like that. So I definitely think um, it's important to continue to address it. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Katie. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's one of the perks of working in like a higher level collegiate athletics um, venue is that you're able to work on this stuff concurrently while they're still participating at a high level. So I've done the same. I've been treating athletes who are working back through their return to play progressions and stuff like that and just addressing their impairments, whether they be visual or cervical or anything. Thanks, guys. Um, I also think, so it sounds like you guys have a really good setup as far as like how often you see the patient. Um, it seems very connected. Uh, what happens when, let's say, you have a list of things you want to clear the patient, but that's not the same across 
let's say you have an organization with a hospital group for the PTs, and then athletics is fairly separate from that. Uh, how would you navigate that? Would you just kind of let them do their thing, or would you want to kind of see them to make sure they pass all these, the list of stringent tests? For me, I think the communication piece is really big there. So talking to your athlete and talking to whoever else is involved with their care about that kind of stuff. Um, and I think it depends on the severity of your symptoms as well. So if you're seeing that they have a lot of impairments and you think that they shouldn't be playing, then addressing that with the people who are involved, including the patient. Um, but I think communication will be the biggest piece there. I agree. Um... We're lucky we kind of have a, a whole protocol already in place where they have to go through specific steps with their athletic trainer, with PTs, with the team physician, with our um, neurologist. Like we have, sometimes it's a little bit overkill, but it's good to have these in place. Um, I think if you're in that setting and that's something that uh, you're maybe not on the same page with is to sit down and kind of develop some type of protocol or at least a checklist that you can go through and you know that either you're all doing the same thing or when they're not sure they can refer back and forth um, in order to make sure that you are checking those boxes and that you're not missing something. Thanks and how do you guys navigate um, medical disqualifications? The severity play a factor into it. A lot of athletes like transfers might come in with unreported ones from different countries um, is it just the number of them? Um, how would you kind of make a decision for that with your medical team? That is a great question. I don't, I mean, I've heard some numbers thrown around. I don't think that there is a set number. Um, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Um, I have had that conversation with people, but I am never the deciding factor. Um, and so I kind of look at it as, how many they've had, how severe it is, how long they take to recover, um, where they're at, like what, are they planning on doing this for the rest of their life? Do they have any long-term issues that keep building with each one? Uh, at some point, I have had people that have taken a long time or have had multiple that do decide that um, they value other things more than their sport and they wanna get out of it. It is a tough conversation. Um, but I don't think I've had people that have had three, four concussions and each take a week or so to get back. And they're like, well, whatever, I'm good. Like, I want to keep playing. This is what I want to do. I want to play professionally. It's fine. Um, and then the opposite side of that as well. So I think you have to look at it from a very holistic approach. Um, and I would say our team physicians and the student athlete are the ones in the end to make the decision. Yeah, I would agree with everything that Marie said. And the other thing I would say is it's often not just the number of concussions that they've had, but how long it takes for them to recover. And Marie kind of touched on this too, but if somebody has four concussions and each time it takes them a week to get better, then that's one thing. But if the first time they have a concussion, it takes a few days. And then the second time it takes two weeks. And then the, sec the third time it takes three months. That's a lot more concerning to me because you're seeing a pattern there. So you definitely want to avoid those sequelae of symptoms. Thanks. And I have one more question before I stop hogging the mic. Uh, Maria, this is for you with your the VR you <laughs> use. Does it only have that test loaded on it and give you that report? Or does it give you like saccades, um, any errors, the distance of error, and can you do kind of training on it or is it just like one kind of testing software? Yeah, you can actually do, um, it started as just a uh, smooth pursuit as a test. Um, and now they've uh, kind of developed it more where you can do smooth pursuit, uh, saccades and VOR on it, actually and visual motion sensitivity. Um, and then it tracks it, tracks your progress, gives you the metrics for all of them. And then you can also do it, um, a practice setting on it where you can say, I wanna do this for 30 seconds and you can do whatever it is, VOR, visual motion sensitivity, whatever it may be, you can have the goggles on and do it as a practice to improve that. Okay, thank you. That's all I got. Yeah, yeah. that's all I got.
Great, Katie. Thanks for being on tonight. Um, question for you, Marie, is when they have those goggles on, um, what do they see during that? Is it, is it transparent? Is it just like they see their surroundings? What's that like? So there's two different backgrounds. The main one is just a black background and all they see is a red dot. It's um, hopefully we can develop it a little bit more at some point, but as of right now, um, it's just the VR goggles with the phone right in front. Um, for the, that's, and then for saccades, you have a black background and two red dots. Um, and then for VOR, a black background, a red dot, and then two horizontal and two vertical lines, depending on which one you're doing. Uh, it is actually kind of cool for the visual motion sensitivity. Uh, they did create kind of an augmented, not really augmented related, but um, it is a scene from, I believe it's the Red Sox, their uh, baseball field. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so you can have those on and you do your whole body turn um, and it looks like you're standing at Fenway. And so everything else moves just like it would if you were in the room. Um, that's where the technology is right now, but um, eventually hopefully it can be something more like you're talking about where it's transparent and it's more of uh, an augmented reality. Yeah, I mean, just even to make it like an advancement of, you know, their surroundings, busy field, things moving in the back, things not moving. Yes. Advancing on from that black screen, I think would be super useful. Really cool though that you get numbers on that stuff. That's those are really impressive. I mean, it's it's a lot better than just doing the bombs and just you know symptom score and going through that. Um, the other question I had, um, I, this has always been interesting to me because I, I do a lot of manipulations in my practice. Um, have you ever had either one of you or even VN? Have you guys ever had a positive um, you know precautionary test when that you take them back? and you're looking for that um, vertebral basal or artery insufficiency, have you ever had a positive where you, you know, referred out because that, um, you know, uh, ruled out doing a manipulation at all? I have not. I haven't. Not wood. Yeah. I haven't for the vertebral artery test. I have had um, a questionable, two questionable tests that we had to put people in a cease collar and send them out for CT. Uh, one and then the other one was we decided it wasn't but I had one person doing um, just active range of motion and looking down she'd get uh, paresthesias in both arms um, so we put her in a seat collar and sent her to get uh, I don't know if it was a x-ray or a CT but we sent her to the ER uh, and then I had somebody actually last week that uh, was going through some tests and uh, did the um, called the plate test where you're pulling up and it started to feel nauseous, um, not lump in his throat, but kind of some jaw pain and some other weird symptoms that I wasn't expecting. Um, so I grabbed one of our physicians and nobody else had seen him. I was the first one to see him actually, um, but he was negative, but I have not had anybody with um, any type of arterial insufficiency. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I, I've had vestibular patients that, you know, cause it's that testing position of uh six hall pikes that you know it, it ends up being positive but um uh, i've never had it before that and i was just curious you know if they had any specific symptoms um because i i've never the, the conversations i've had with other clinicians nobody's ever had a positive on it so i just wonder sometimes to the psychometrics behind the test too because i know they're not crazy reliable or sensitive um or i should say specific um so I just kind of sometimes wonder the utility behind them, but I know it's precautionary. So it's best to, use to, best to use them than to not use them. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a question after you asked that, Ryan. So someone that I see for a concussion, I generally don't do a cervical manip only because I took this, like it was a weekend course by some uh, former fellows of manual therapy. And one of the indications was like any kind of like high velocity trauma. Um, I think it's very different than a car accident, but I always thought like a collision uh, in football, even if it might be like a whiplash kind of deal was counted as that. So I'm just very uh, cautious about that. Um, so, I mean, I think if I screen it out, I 
could do that. But um, what do you guys think about that concept? Would you guys consider that the same severity or not quite and fairly safe to do? Sounds like it is safe to do. Yeah, that's why I like to start at the thoracic spine first, because if you can affect their motion at the cervical spine by manipulating the thoracic spine and not having to do a high velocity manip, then I would prefer to do that. But I think it depends on the situation, on the severity of their symptoms, on the impact of the hit and stuff like that. Thanks, Katie. That's helpful. I um. Uh, you know, I, I think similarly too, and I, I don't do it on anybody who's um, acute. Um, I, I really like to see that symptom score to be zero when I when I do do those manipulations, um, especially in a concussion. Well, in a concussion patient, um, I did read an article that demonstrated that there's more side effects with like cervical mobilizations and an increased soreness and in mobilizations versus a manip. Um, I couldn't tell you name or year of the article whatsoever, or even the author name. Um, but that kind of tilted me a little bit more to being like, you know, cervical manips, they're safe, they're reliable if you, you're skilled in them. So I, I think sometimes it's even quicker and just less intrusive to just get that quick cavitation versus, you know, mobilizing somebody for like five minutes. Yeah, that's a good point. I could see how that paper would get to that or how it got there. So that makes sense. Yeah. Um, any more questions though? All right, it seems like that's all for now. Um, so thanks again, Marie and Katie. Katie, I know it's late. Marie, it's probably 70 degrees and sunny outside there. <laughs> Something um, like that. Yeah, but thanks so much for presenting. I know it does take a lot of time to prepare this. So thanks again uh, for both presenting and everyone else for attending. Next week, we'll be back on Wednesday. It'll be me again with Dr. Tim Suchamel over at Carroll University. Um, he'll be going over the force velocity curve with Olympic weightlifting. And then I'll have a case study um, that will broaden up on how you can incorporate it in lower extremity rehab. So thanks and hope to see you guys there again. Cool. Thanks, Pam. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys.